Good afternoon. So I was asked to speak at a camp meeting and they gave me the topic, which I hate because that means I have to do some research. And the topic was the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people in the Old Testament. Now, it's not an area that I'd done a lot of study in, but I, I did my study, I got up, I made my presentation. And as I made the presentation, I mentioned that it's interesting how in the biblical narrative it mentions that King David and King Saul were good-looking men. Now, this wasn't the central part of my talk, but I mentioned it. Afterward, a very well-dressed, well-spoken, middle-aged woman came up to me and thanked me for coming. And then she looked at me with a knowing look in her eye and she said, that was Gary talking to Gary, wasn't it? And I said, sorry? She said, you talk, it was Gary talking to Gary. I said, I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're saying. And she looked at me and she said, yeah, you can be so thankful that you're not good looking. Uh, I looked at her, I said, excuse me, hoping there was a punchline, that this was a joke. She said, yeah, I'm so, you can be so thankful that you are not good looking. She said, I have known so many pastors, so many leaders in the church who were good looking and it was their downfall. She said, but God can use you. (laughs) 
I wasn't sure if I was supposed to thank her, or what the appropriate response was. And so I was a little devastated by this. And a couple of days later, I was on the phone to my father and I said, Dad, you wouldn't believe what this lady said to me. Da, 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 da. And he said, well, Gary, at last someone's had the courage to tell you the truth. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you can't even turn to your own family for comfort and support, but you'll be happy to know that after months and years of therapy, it's all working out. Uh, you know, there are times when we look in the mirror and we do not like what we see. And I'm not just talking about physical mirrors, I'm talking about spiritual mirrors. Last year I was in uh, Scotland with my family and in Edinburgh, and you know, they have this golden mile, and I was walking down there, and I saw this fabulous church. Oh, this is beautiful, I love to look in old churches. So I walked across, came closer, and I found out it was a cafe. And I kind of stood there stunned, because this is like a symbol of what has been happening to Christianity in the, in the West. Uh, since then, I've become a little bit of a connoisseur of former church buildings that have been turned into apartments, that have been turned into bars, into nightclubs, into restaurants, into libraries, into cafes, all sorts of things. And I look in the spiritual mirror of our church, and I look in the spiritual mirror of my own life, and I say, where are we headed? And the theme of this conference is about that beautiful text in the book of Acts about people who turn the world upside down, but I'm concerned that the world is turning us upside down. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 5. It's a passage of Scripture we know well where, where Jesus calls the first disciples. He's teaching the people Crowds are pressing against him. He's got no room to move, and so he goes and he sits in a fishing boat, and he teaches them from there. As he's teaching, he looks across, and he says, sees the fishermen who are washing their nets. When he's finished speaking, he calls out to the fishermen, and he says, push out into deep waters and let down your nets for a catch. Now, you've got to get the picture here of these fishermen. They've been fishing all night. They're tired. They're hungry. They just want to go home, have breakfast, and go to bed. But Jesus says, push out again. And I think if I'd been one of those fishermen, I would have been tempted to say, Jesus, you are a wonderful carpenter. You are a wonderful teacher. But with the greatest respect, we are the professional fishermen. Our fathers are fishermen. Our grandfathers were fishermen. We know every trick. We know every method. And last night, we tried everything, Lord, and you just have nights like that. We're tired. We want to just go home, have breakfast, and go to bed. But if they had taken that attitude, they would have missed out. And it's interesting to see what Peter says. Peter says, verse 5, Master, we've worked hard all night. We haven't caught anything. But because you say so, we'll do it. Powerful message there. All the clinical, empirical evidence. Measure it in a laboratory. The evidence is no fish, bad night, forget it, we'll try again later. But Peter went further than that. He said, Lord, I'm going to put aside my senses, my personal reason, reasoning, my human, human thoughts, and because you say so, I'll do it. And we know what's happened, that there were so many fish, the nets started to break, and we know that boats had to come in and help, and wonderful story. But it's not about the fishing economy of Lake Galilee. Because if you read down a little bit further, Jesus makes the application in verse 10 where he says, don't be afraid, from now on you will catch people. I was reading the Washington Post a few years ago, a story about an Englishman, Mr. Alec Holden. Now, Mr. Holden woke up on his 90th birthday and he was feeling very healthy. And uh, he decided that he would walk down to the local bookie and place a bet. He handed over 100 British pounds and said, this is 
to bet that I will be alive in 10 years' time. Well, I'm sure that bookie smiled to himself, never thinking that he would see this man again, thinking this would be the easiest money he would make that day. But sure enough, 10 years later, Mr. Holden woke up, 100 years of age, got dressed, went straight down to that bookie and collected a cool 25,000 British pounds. Now, please hear me clearly. I am not advocating gambling. This is a story. This is a, I will apply a spiritual principle here. The media crowded around. Mr. Holden, what is the secret of your longevity? How did you make it to 100 years of age? What is the secret? And Mr. Holden paused and looked into the cameras. And I, I don't remember it all, but I remember he said, um, well, you've got to eat your porridge every morning. But this is the part that I really remember. He says, and if you want to live to be 100, you have to keep breathing. He said, if you quit breathing, you're in a whole lot of trouble. I thought, how true that is. Not just in our physical lives, but in our spiritual lives. We have to keep breathing. And yeah, when we think about that, we think about Bible study, essential. We think about prayer, essential. Sometimes we overlook that outreach, service, ministry, and mission is just as important for our spiritual breathing, just as important. It's just as important to push out into deep waters for Jesus Christ. So we've been hearing a lot about revival and reformation in recent years. But I must admit, when I first heard that, I got a little bit nervous because in my experience, often talk of revival and reformation can have the wrong impact and make us start thinking more about ourselves than on a world we're supposed to reach. And we start looking at our own performance looking in that spiritual mirror and seeing if we're tallying up, whether we're measuring up, whether we're good enough and all this and all that, and we, we lose sight of Jesus Christ and the mission he's given us. So that's why I'm greatly encouraged to hear church leaders talking about revival and reformation for mission. It has a purpose. It's not just to, to sanctify the saints. It's to make us effective in service for Jesus. Ellen White tells the story of a man who got lost in a snowstorm. He's pushing his way through the, through the storm and finally he was just exhausted and he collapsed into the snow. And as he collapsed into that snow, he felt the warmth coming into his body and he started to relax as death started to reach out its tentacles. But then she said she, he heard the, the moans and the groans of a fellow traveler nearby and instinctively, without thinking about it, he reached out and found that fellow traveler and immediately started chafing his limbs, trying to get that blood circulating again. And Ellen White says that in giving life back to that fellow traveler, he gave life to himself. As we push out into deep waters for Jesus, as we take the mission he has given us to reach into a world that is in need, we will find ourselves spiritually revived. And Jesus said, push out into deep waters and let your nets down for a catch. How do we do that? Um, you know, the fishing is a metaphor. Today, 2014, Melbourne, Australia, in our own context, how do we do that? How do we push out? Well, at the risk of sounding cliched, I want to suggest to you that there is only one way, and it's a way that was amply demonstrated and modelled by our Saviour. And it's a way that Ellen White says is the only way that will bring true success. Not, just, not one of the ways, but the only way that will bring true success the Christ method. The first step in Christ's method is that the Saviour mingled. What does it mean to mingle? 
Jesus demonstrated that himself when he came to earth. And as an interesting exercise sometime, read Matthew chapter 8 and chapter 9 and write down every time you see Jesus physically touching somebody. It'll surprise you. Jesus became one with us. He pitched his tent among us. He rubbed shoulders among us. He mingled as one who desired our good. He didn't come down from heaven and just immediately start preaching at people. He mingled with people as one who desired their good. Now, someone such as me who holds an administrative position in the church, this is a wake-up call because it is so easy to find every excuse in the world to do everything but mingle. I'm busy with this, I'm busy with that. And unfortunately, some of the programs and activities of our church at times have the, have the unexpected effect of stopping us from mingling. So on Sabbath morning, we have wonderful worship services in our churches. We come in and sometimes we drive in from 10 miles away and we're blessed on Sabbath morning. We have sweet fellowship with each other. Then we drive home again and the community around us wouldn't even know we were there. And at times we are tempted to do evangelism by proxy, by remote control. And so we sometimes ease back into the fallback position of, I'll send my finances to help mission. Or I will pray for the evangelist who comes to do mission. Or I will, I will distribute books that won't involve me in actually having to talk to somebody. And it's a whole lot of effort to actually get out there and make friends with non-believers because we don't have a whole lot in common. So I'm going to push that aside. And so we, we keep ourselves separate like we're some sort of a holy country club. And we ignore the fundamental first step of any evangelism process that will bring success. And that is we have to mingle. Um, this may look to you like a coffee shop, but it's not. Well, it is, but it's also something else. This, for many years, was my brother's church office uh, because they planted a church up on the central coast where they didn't have a permanent church building. Uh, Wayne started to go to the local shopping mall, and when Borders Bookstore was there, right in the middle of it, there was a cafe, and he would be there for several hours every day to conduct Bible studies, to do counseling, to meet people. It was a way to get outside of the church environment to mingle where the people are. Well, already he has married three young couples who had never met a Christian pastor before, who he met there. Uh, he had only been working there for, uh, he had only been um, doing his thing there for a, a few months when one of the one of the servers, one of the young women came up to him and she wasn't a Christian, but she said, Pastor Wayne, can I be your secretary? He said, oh, sure, no problem. And so she kept his appointments for him. And she would go out to the front of the cafe and greet people and say, yeah, um, Pastor Wayne will be ready for your premarital counseling in 10 minutes. He's just finishing up a Bible study. I don't know what your method is, but I tell you, I had to find out my own methods, otherwise I'd be stuck in an office in the general conference doing exactly what I'm not supposed to do. The Saviour mingled as one who desired people's good. The second step was the Saviour showed sympathy in this beautiful text, how when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That is the stance, that is the perspective from which Jesus viewed the people. He didn't see them as some sort of a target. He didn't see them just as baptismal statistics. He saw them as people who he loved, he'd created and cared for. Do people know us as Seventh-day Adventists, as people who have compassion? You remember, well, you won't remember, you're too young, but many years ago, the Seventh-day Adventist church adopted a slogan which was, Seventh-day Adventist Church, the caring church. 
Beautiful slogan, wonderful slogan, made me proud to be an Adventist. There's only one problem with it. We did not realize that a slogan like that is something that you have to earn. It's not something you can give yourself. Is that a fair statement? What do people know us for? Are we known as people who follow in Jesus' footsteps and care for people and show compassion? Uh, this is the entrance to the, uh, it's really a Salvation Army facility where my brother's church worships. You can see some gang members out the front, some bikies who are worshiping that Sabbath. Out the front, there is a skateboard park. And Saturday mornings are very popular for kids in the neighborhood to come and ride their skateboards and their bikes, and they make a lot of noise. And the only place nearby where there are any sort of toilet facilities are in the building where the church is worshiping. So these kids want to use the toilet. What does the church do? Well, we're having worship here. You guys make a whole lot of noise. Sorry, you've got to find somewhere else. Is that the attitude? Well, let me tell you, there are many churches where that would be the attitude. And it's that it would be the attitude because the focus of the church is not on ministry and mission. The focus is on keeping the saints comfortable. Having an environment on Sabbath morning where we can be safe and happy and have a good worship. And I'm not, I don't want to be cynical. That is important. We want that but not if it comes at the expense of us mingling and showing the sympathy of Jesus. So these kids come in, they make a lot of noise, and the church is happy to hear them, to have them nearby. And then after church is finished, they invite the kids in for a hot meal, and if they don't want to come in, they take it out to them. It's a question of where our focus is as we follow Christ's mission. They have a Sabbath school class that I've never seen anywhere else in the world. Wherever you go, there's usually a... You know, the kids' classes, adult classes, there's usually a pastor's class teaching the fundamental beliefs, etc. But this is the first time that I've ever encountered a smoker's Sabbath school class. And if you look, look closely, if you have your binoculars, you'll see that people are holding Bibles and Sabbath school lesson pamphlets, but also cigarettes in their hands. And, and before you come and labor with my soul afterward, uh, people have already done that with me. You know, this is compromise. This is encouraging the wrong thing. Well, I just say two things. Number one, what do we say to people like this? They can't go for 30 minutes without a cigarette, but they want to learn about Jesus. Do we say, clean up your act and then come to church? Kind of gets the gospel around the wrong way, right? And if they can't come to us as Seventh-day Adventists to learn about Jesus, where do we send them? And it's a question of where our stance and our priority is. Yeah, it's a nuisance having people in the church smoking cigarettes. I hate, I'm allergic to it. But where is our priority? What is our number one concern? The Savior mingled, he showed sympathy. He ministered to needs. Just beautiful. I just love to bathe myself, myself in the Gospels and just see how Jesus ministered to needs. Time and again, when he was exhausted, he ministered to needs. It's interesting when we look at the rapid growth of Christianity. We often think about, well, yeah, there was a strong focus on church planting. Uh, there was fabulous preaching. There were Holy Spirit-inspired leaders, all good things. But one of the things we often overlook, and you will find this in books written by a sociologist called Rodney Stark, who at the time was not a Christian, but is today. He looks at the growth of Christianity, and he puts the major factor down to the fact that these Christians were people who cared for people. He goes through the documents. He looks at the original documents. He looks at the emperor and his, some of his letters that he wrote, and he, he comes up with this picture where, where play, when plague or sickness would hit a city, the first people to rush outside were the pagan priests to the safety of the countryside. The only people who remained in the cities to care for the sick were the Christians. And the pagan emperor lambasted his priests, saying, these Galileans... 
They care for our people as well as theirs, and they do a much better job than we do. And it was that practical ministry of healing that built so, much, so many bridges to a pagan population. Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, this is one of the least reached cities in North America for the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In fact, Pastor George Vanderman ran an evangelistic series back in the 1950s, and today there are fewer Seventh-day Adventists in Pittsburgh than there were back then. Well, a few years back, a, a hurricane hit Pittsburgh, and the Pennsylvania Conference hired this young man here, Andrew Clark, and he later married Mida, just a graduate straight out of college, ministerial, to come and head up Adventist community services. You could see some of the devastation that happened in, um, in this area. People lost their houses. There were a lot of flooding. And so Andrew moved in. He and his team helped the people rebuild their lives. And then they started getting involved in all sorts of other activities. They got involved in the local arts and heritage festival. It was basically what they called a booze and blues festival. But the church became a part sponsor and made it more family friendly. They started getting involved in cleanup activities, planting gardens, getting rid of graffiti, different activities for, um, for young people making a difference in their community. I think of another initiative in Atlanta. Uh, you'll see with the red hair at the front there, Stacy, Stacy Sweeney. She and her, her husband, uh, Rustin, were living very comfortably in an upper-class neighborhood of, of Atlanta. They would come to church on Sabbath morning. They would then go home, have lunch, then they would have a sleep, Next Sabbath, they'd go back to church, they'd come home, have lunch, and they'd have a sleep, same next Sabbath. And one day, they looked at each other and they said, is that all there is to Christianity? We're playing it so safe. So Rustin and Stacy got out the Bible, they got out Ellen White's writings, and they read through together, and they kept a note paper where they jotted down everything that they felt the Holy Spirit was saying, saying something to them. They wrote down every time. And Rustin showed me the pages and pages of handwriting. And they became convicted that they needed to change their life. And so they got on the internet and they researched, where is the poorest neighborhood in Atlanta? And then they decided to move there with their young children. They had... Um, sorry, it's killed. Can we advance to the next slide? I'll keep talking while that's moving forward. Rustin and Stacy got involved in all sorts of community activities. They would do things like holding a breakfast for everybody in the community. They started community gardens. Their door was open day, on, day and night for people to come in and out. I, I spoke with one woman who was a single mother, and she said, the only time that I let my son out to play is when I see Rustin and Stacy's kids out there because I know it's safe. The first few weeks, they had trouble getting to sleep many evenings during the week because of the gunfire. Their car was stolen three or four times and returned. But they stayed there because they were there mingling. They were showing sympathy. They were ministering to needs. When I visited, oh yeah, here, thank you. Here we have their aims. They wanted to provide strong hope, significant purpose, and secure love. What a mission statement. And here you can see some of the activities they involved in. The day that I visited, I got home and I checked my email and Rustin had sent me an email and he said, you know, you should have stayed, Gary. You missed all the fun. He said, soon after you left, two young guys came and stole my bicycle. He said, so I chased after them, I caught them, and one of them is now in my Bible study group. I said to Rustin, you know, your, your door's open day or night. I said, you an outgoing person? He said, no, I, he said, I find it very hard. He said, I'm never happier than when I'm sitting by myself reading a book. But God called them to a mission to follow Christ's example. And he's not going to call everybody to look for the poorest neighborhood in the area. He may call you to the richest neighborhood. But each of us is called to push out into deep waters, 
to mingle, to show sympathy, and to minister to needs. The final step was that Jesus won confidence. This video is going to play as I talk. Uh, when Andrew Clark moved to Pittsburgh, can you click that video to make sure it goes, please? When Andrew went to Pittsburgh, he, he was welcomed, obviously, because there was such a, a lot of need, and they helped rebuild the people's lives. But then it came to the stage where they needed to get a special permit to com continue working. And the town council basically said, we've got enough churches in the area. Thank you so much, but goodbye. Well, they wrote a letter of appeal, and a town council meeting was held. And that evening at the town council, the aldermen sat at the front, and then they had the largest turnout that they'd ever had from the community. More than 200 people came from the community. You can find this video on YouTube. Just look for Becoming Carnegie, Becoming Carnegie. When I first saw this video, tears streamed down my eyes, down my face, because here was a community that had come out, and the first person at the microphone was a Roman Catholic priest. We need the Seventh-day Adventist in our community. After him, there was the Anglican priest. There were business people. There were teachers. There were mothers. There were doctors, one after the other. Adventists have come here. They've made such a difference. We need them in our community. Wow. It reminds me back in, in the book of Acts, you know, where it talks about how the Christians found favor with all the people. We often think about the negatives of persecution, but there was a time there where they found favor because they were in there making a difference in people's lives. What if in every community people were to come and say, we need Seventh-day Adventists in our community? Uh, Andrew got a lot of criticism not from the community, but from church members. We've invested a lot of money in this project. You're supposed to be planting a church. All you seem to be doing is mingling, mingling, mingling. When are we going to see some results? When are we going to see some baptisms? But Andrew kept focused, mingling, showing sympathy, ministering to needs over and over again. Then one day I got this email from him, subject, huge, great problem, so many Bible study requests, he didn't know what to do with them. Wondering if we could help him find a Bible worker to come in to help cope with the demand. Because Ellen White says, Christ's method alone will bring true success. Mingle, show sympathy, minister to needs, win confidence. So often, we kind of bypass Christ's method. We short-circuit it, and we move straight into, he bid them follow. We move straight into the preaching when we have not earned the right, when we have not followed Christ's example. And every time we do that, we are short-circuiting Christ's method. And let me suggest to you, as we look today at the apostasy rates in the Adventist church, which make us get down on our knees and pray to God for, when we look at the high apostasy rates, Part of the reason I'd like to suggest to you this afternoon is that we preach at people without following Christ's holistic ministry. And so we have people coming in with a head knowledge. They've been converted because they've assented to a few doctrines, but their hearts haven't been changed and they haven't experienced the holistic mission that Christ called us to give. Sure, it takes more time. It's messy. You might encounter people who have bad habits like smoking and drinking. They may not, they can make a nuisance of themselves. But if we are to have a genuine impact on our world, there is only way to have true success, and that is to follow Christ's example. Um, one of the projects that my brother's church got involved in was that they saw a local public school, that kids were coming to school every day and they were hungry. They hadn't had a pro proper breakfast. So they went to the principal and they said, can we provide a breakfast for your 
kids who are coming hungry, haven't had breakfast, and they, they said, sure. So they've had a program going there for many years providing breakfast to these kids. No strings attached. Following Christ's method, caring for the community. Then one day the principal decided that they needed to have a chaplain at the school. They'd never had a chaplain. So she went to her staff and they said, and she presented the idea, we need to have a chaplain. The staff said, terrific idea. But they all said, but only if it come, the chaplain comes from the Seventh-day Adventist church, public school. So then they called the parents in for a parents' teacher's night and the, and the principal pitched the idea as well. You know, we need to have a chaplain and the parents gave the same response. Yes, but only if the chaplain comes from the Seventh-day Adventist church. It wins confidence. You know, as we look at the next step, he bid them follow. As human beings, we have a tendency to get unbalanced. One extreme is to come along and we only preach at people. Another extreme is to do the other four steps and never, ever invite people to follow Jesus. So what I am advocating this afternoon is not that we become just another social welfare agency. And let me tell you, I believe in social welfare agencies. I think they do a wonderful work, an important work. We need more of it. But we are called to a holistic ministry that also includes, once we have won confidence, we take the opportunity to bid people to follow Jesus. We want to see people baptized and become members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. As we look at the uh, churches here in, in, in Australia, perhaps the most loved, the most recognized, with the strongest brand recognition is the Salvation Army. I can remember as a kid, I used to go door knocking, collecting, in gathering, right? And I also at times collected for the Salvation Army. And I may only have been 10 years of age, but I can tell you it was a whole lot easier collecting for the Salvation Army because they were known, they were recognized, making a difference in the community, doing a wonderful work. However, for many years now, the Salvation Army has struggled with a declining membership like this. Loved, recognized, perhaps the best brand name in the country, and yet a declining membership. And as Adventists, we need to take care that as we follow Christ's example, as we, as we mingle, as we show sympathy, as we minister to needs, as we win confidence, that we find ways to then bridge to Jesus. And let me tell you, it's a whole lot easier to bridge to Jesus when people ask you the question, when you've had that confidence, when you have that intimate relationship, and then they start asking you the questions because they have nobody else to blame when you give them the answer than themselves because they asked you. And it's amazing how naturally it comes once we put the time into following Christ's method. And we're finding increasingly in secular countries, we're finding this in Europe, we're finding it increasingly in North America, that the time that it takes from somebody to go from complete secularism to a baptized Seventh-day Adventist can take years. It can take years of mingling, making friendships, building those relationships till it comes to that stage where they want to learn more about the Savior that motivates us. Seren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, told the story of a mock battle. And where we live in the United States, it's, there's a lot of Civil War battlefield sites all around us. You can just go an hour or so north and you come to Gettysburg. And every year, many of these battlefield sites have reenactments. And it's amazing the lengths to which the men will go to get an authentic experience. They'll put on their uniforms. They'll have the correct guns. They'll go through all the right formations in the right places. And Kierkegaard talked about a mock battle where, where it looks like a battle, it sounds like a battle, it smells like a battle, but they're only using pretend bullets. He says there's only one thing missing. There's no danger. 
It looks, it sounds, it smells like a battle, but there's no danger. And then in his usual subtle way, he says, this is what the church is like in 19th century Denmark. He says, on Sunday morning, people come to church, they're wearing their Sunday best, they have their prayer books, they have their hymn books, they sing the songs, they go through the liturgy. He says, it's, it looks like Christianity, it smells like Christianity, sounds like Christianity, except there's one thing missing. There's no danger. But what's the danger? Jesus said, push out into deep waters for me, but you know, we're much more comfortable paddling around in the shallow end of the pool where it's safe, right? When you're a kid and you first learn to swim, you, you stay in the shallow end and you clutch the side of the pool and, and it's only until you gain confidence that you discover that the real fun is in the deep end of the swimming pool. It's the same with Christianity. And sure, pushing out into deep waters for Jesus can be uncomfortable. You, it can be dangerous. It can cost you. It can cost you time. It can cost you money. But it's where the fun is. It's where the adventure is. And as I see many young people choosing to leave the Adventist church, I think part of the reason is we've made it too safe. We've made it a place where you come on Sabbath morning and you try to stay, stay awake until you, the dismissal at 12 noon, and that's what Christianity is. And we forget that the Christian life is an adventure. Read Hebrews 11 again. The deep waters can be scary, but not if we read the Great Commission correctly. Sometimes as we read the Great Commission, we skip over important parts and we go straight into the, into the go ye into all the world part. And we forget verse 18 where Jesus came to them and he said, All authority in heaven and earth is given to me, therefore go. The only reason we can go is because Jesus is with us and he has all authority in heaven and earth. Is the deep waters dangerous? Yeah, but not when you've got Jesus with you. When you have the one who has all authority in heaven and earth. I challenge you this, this afternoon. I challenge myself as we look into the spiritual mirror. Make an assessment and let's pray again, Lord, I don't know what the deep waters are that you may have in mind for me, but make me willing to push out into deep waters for you. May God richly bless you.